Uh, good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mother, and today is 25th of April 2021, and the day today is Sunday, and right now we are studying the subject of physics. This is all about physics. The code is 5054. Today we have set our hearts to solve uh, May, June 2020 paper. The number of the paper is 22. This is a theory paper, and that belongs from the zone two. So in this session, we are going to solve only the section A of this paper, the section B of this paper. I will solve in another video. So uh, let's start uh, without any delay. Let's start the paper. Okay, so here we go. So we have this question paper. So May, June, we are working on the May, June 2020, two, two paper. Let's start. This is summer two two. So the first question coming, uh, figure one point one shows part of the speed time graph for an athlete in a race. So here we have a speed time graph, and you can see on the x-axis we have time. The time is given in seconds, and on the y-axis we have speed, and the speed is given in meters per second. So for the first two seconds, he has drawn the speed time graph. And before we start solving this, you should remember that in the speed time graph, the, the slope or the gradient of the speed time graph is equals to the acceleration, or you can say deceleration, retardation, and the area under the speed time graph is equals to the distance traveled. So if the gradient is uh, constant, the uh, acceleration, is uniform if the gradient is uh, not constant, the acceleration produced will be non-uniform. Okay, so the first question coming up on your screen is question number one. A part is during the race, the acceleration of the athlete is uniform in the first two seconds. State how the graph shows that the acceleration is uniform. You can see you have, if you look at the graph, the graph uh, is a straight line and its gradient is not changing. Its gradient is constant in the first two seconds. So because the gradient is constant, that shows that the acceleration is equals, uh, acceleration is uniform. There is an equal change in the velocity in equal intervals of time. That's why I will say that the acceleration is uniform. So let me show you my work. I have done also this work and, okay, so let's put this thing here. Okay. So in the first two seconds, the gradient of the, the gradient of the speed time graph is constant. So this is how that graph is showing that the acceleration is uniform. So let's move to the next part. And the next part is, <clears throat> He says, determine the distance traveled by the athlete in the first two seconds is the speed time graph is given to us. And we can find out the distance traveled by calculating uh, the area under the speed time graph. Let me show you that graph. Okay, so here you see, if I draw a line here, so this is the speed time graph for the first two seconds. I can find out the distance traveled by simply calculating the area under the speed time graph. And if the shape will be a triangle and uh, this point here, you see this point here. So this value will be two and this value, this, this height, that will be nine. So I can apply the formula one by two base into height and that will give me the area. So I have done this on a paper. Let me show you a very simple question and you can understand this easily. So I have noted down two points uh, because it was a straight line, uh, 0, 0, and 2, 9. So this shape makes a triangle. Area under the graph is a triangle. So the formula for the area under the triangle so in the shape of a triangle will be 1 by 2 into base into height. And 1 by 2 base is 2 and the height is 9. So when you multiply that, 2, 2 will be cancelled and 9 meters. So the distance traveled in the first two seconds is 9 meters. So let's check the marking scheme, what the marking scheme has to say about the first two parts. And then we can move on. Okay, so here we have the marking scheme for the May, June 2020. Okay, so here we go. Here we have, let me increase the size first of all. Okay. 
for this I so you can see the question number <coughs> one a part constant gradient one b part use the use of area under the graph one by two vt or average speed 4.5 meter per second nine meter will be the final answer so our work is perfect so let's move to the next part the next part is the okay this is the next part and have a good look over it so he says during the rest of the race from two seconds to 5.5 seconds, the acceleration of the athlete decreases. So if the acceleration of the athlete will decrease from two to 5.5, the gradient of that line should gradually decrease, should not come downward. Don't confuse it with that the graph should be coming downward. No, I mean, the graph is going upward. Its, its slope should gradually decrease. It should not come downward. At 5.5 seconds, the athlete reaches a maximum speed of 12 meters per second from 5.5 seconds to 8.0 uh, seconds, that lead travels at a speed of 12 meter per second. Then his speed will remain constant. And from 8.0 seconds to 11.0 seconds, that lead decelerates, finishing the race at a speed of 10 meter per second. When he will decelerate, then the graph will come downward. And uh, on the figure 1.1, complete the speed time graph for the times between two seconds and 11 seconds. I've drawn this. Let me show you my work. Uh, and then we can go. Okay, here we go. So, so this graph is showing uh, from zero to two seconds. Uh, he was moving with a constant uh, acce uniform acceleration. And here, after that, he, his acceleration gradually decreased. Okay. Then he reached at the, at, I think, the five point something second, 5.5 .5 second. He reached the maximum speed of 12. That speed is 12. And till 8 seconds, he continued with that speed. So it's a speed time graph. So if he's moving at a constant speed, so that graph will be a flat line, like this horizontal flat line. Then at eight seconds, what happened? His speed, uh, he, he decreased his speed gradually. And he finished the race. Uh, when he will decrease his speed, actually decelerate, the graph will come downward. And at 11 seconds, he finished the race and his speed was 10 meter per second. So this is how I have drawn this graph with the help of a cursor. And that graph is not that smooth, but you can draw my lines are going up and down. But they are not supposed to go up and down. I've drawn it with the cursor. So that's why there is a little bit going up and down. Uh, so, but when you draw, do it, draw it very smoothly, okay? So this is how you will draw that graph. Okay, so let's move to the next part. He says uh, the next question will be the question number two. So the question number two is coming on your screen. And the question number two is, Figure 2.1 shows the thinking distance. Uh, let me the size. Okay. So figure 3. Point, uh, figure 2.1 shows uh, the thinking distance and breaking distance for a car driven at 100 km per hour. The car has old smooth tires. The tires are old and smooth and worn out. So thinking distance is 21 meter, breaking distance is 75 meter. Calculate the total stopping distance for the car. The stopping distance is equal to the thinking distance plus the breaking distance. Stopping distance is equal to thinking distance plus the breaking distance. So 21 meter plus 75 meter, and that will give you uh, 96 meter. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. We will then check the marking scheme also, and we will see what we can do. Okay. So here we go, question number two, a part stopping distance is equal to thinking distance plus the breaking distance. So 21 meter plus 75 meter, that will be 96 meter. So let me check, the, uh, let's check the marking scheme. Uh, we are supposed to check each and every part of the marking scheme, you see. So that was question number one, C part. So now we are on the question number two, 96 meter for a part, okay. So our answer is right. So okay, let's go to the next part. Next question. Okay. So we are on the B part. 
he says uh, the car is now fitted with the new tires at a speed greater than 100 km per hour the total stopping distance is the same as previously state and explain the fact that increase in the speed and the use of the new tires have on the thinking distance there will be no effect on the thinking distance neither the high speed uh, uh, the new tires have first state and explain the fact that the increase in the speed and the use of the new tires have on the thinking distance so the new tires have no effect on the thinking distance but but you see when you increase the speed your reaction time is still the same try to understand this so for example if my reaction time is 0 0.5 seconds and whether i have new tires or i have old tires does not matter my reaction time is 0 0.5 it actually means 0 0.5 seconds. okay so now if i will be moving at a very fast so if I'm moving at a faster speed in 0 0.5 seconds, my car will travel larger distance. If I am moving at let's say 50 meter per second, then my car will travel less distance. If I am moving at 10 meter per second, my thinking, my reaction time still will be 0 0.5 seconds. So now the car will travel very small distance. So because you are moving at a high speed, your speed is more than, uh, he says, greater than 100 kilometer per hour, your reaction time still will be 0 0.5 second, but because you're moving at a faster speed, now in the same reaction time, the car will travel a larger distance. So his question is state and explain the effect that the increase in speed and the use of the new tires have on the thinking distance. New tires have no effect on the thinking distance, but the high speed has. So because your speed is higher, so you have the same reaction time, now the car will travel a larger distance. So, the next part is state and explain the fact that the increase in speed and the new tires have on the braking distance. Whenever you put on new tires, the increase in the speed does have a little bit of effect, but, but when you put new tires on the car, the braking distance is supposed to decrease. That's why we put new tires. If, if by putting new tires, the braking distance still not increased, uh, it, it has not decreased, then what's the point of putting new tires on? So when you put new tires on, on, on the, the, the friction between the road and the tire, that will be very good. So the frictional force against your motion will be good. So now the braking distance should become smaller because you have put on tires. So I think uh, let's check what happens. Uh, these are my ideas, so let's check what happens. This question was not a simple one, it is this answer. Uh, we have to be very, uh, we have to think before answering this question. So let's check what I have done. <clears throat> so uh, increase by higher, thinking distance increases by higher speed. When you have increased, increased speed, your thinking distance obviously will be larger because your reaction time still will be the same if you are moving at a higher speed the car will travel larger distance during that uh, uh, what do you say during that reaction time so explanation because speed is higher so in same reaction time car will cover larger distance the second part was uh, braking distance will decrease because you are also moving at a higher speed you might start thinking about the factor that the car is moving at higher speed that does not matter uh, when i have put new tires on the car then the braking distance should decrease. So new tires will have larger friction with road, so a larger deceleration will be produced. So that's why the car will cover now less distance as compared to when you have worn out, uh, worn out uh, tires, old tires. Ooh, let's check the marking scheme. What the marking scheme has to say about this? This question is not easy. Question number two, this was not easy part. Question number two, B first part, uh, increases time unchanged, but speed faster. Yeah, that's the logic. Time unchanged means time is that your reaction time. And the second part is decreases force of friction largely because you have put new tire and now the force of friction between the road and the tire has increased. A very tricky question. So that was the question number two. Okay, so students, let's move to question number three. So we are moving to the next question. The next question will be the question number three. Here we go. 
Okay. He says the figure 3.1 shows part of a hydraulic press is used to compress waste paper into a brick for burning. A force of 20 Newton is exerted downward on the end of the handle. The force on the handle creates a moment about the pivot. Okay. So try to understand this diagram. You look at this diagram. You see here I have this handle and here is the pivot of this handle. And with this handle here, I also have a piston. When I will, I will push it downward with the two, 20 Newton force. And this piston will also push this liquid downward, this oil downward. So and the point is whatever will be the moment produced by this 20 Newton force on the handle, whatever is the moment produced by this 20 Newton force on, on this handle, same will be the moment produced in this piston P. And you can see for piston P, the pivot is here. And for the, for the handle, uh, where here you applied the force, the pivot is here. So the first question is the force on the handle creates a moment of the pivot. Define the moment of the force. Moment, remember, is a very technical definition. Moment of the force is the product of the applied force uh, with the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the force and the pivot. I can repeat it again. The moment of a force is the product of the force and the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the force and the pivot. So um, I written this answer. So it was, uh, I think, two marks. This definition. This definition is of two marks. And I have written this. Uh, I can show you. And here we go. This is the question number three. And it's A part. So question number three, A part, you can see product of force and the perpendicular distance between the line of action of force and the pivot is called moment of force. A very simple and a straightforward definition. So two mark definition, and it is also very famous. Don't forget this. Okay, so let's move to the next question and we will check the market scheme in the next part because it's easy, there's no problem. He says, explain, uh, explain why the force exerted on the piston P is greater than the force exerted on the handle. You see, if you, if you go here, now try to understand this, my analogy. So the moment produced here and the moment produced in the piston P, they both are equal. And they both are uh, anti-clockwise. The moment produced here is anti-clockwise. The moment produced here is also anti-clockwise. And the moment produced here and the moment produced here in the magnitude, they are both equal to each other. So, but to look at this, the, the force is applied here, it's moment arm, the perpendicular distance of the from the pivot to the line of action of this force. The moment arm of this handle is large. The moment arm of this force is quite large. So this force uh, on the handle, its moment arm is very large. And the moment is the product of F and D, the moment arm and the force. The moment produced here at the P is also same, equal, equal moment produced here. So its moment arm is very small. And the moment is force multiplied distance. If this moment arm is small, then to have the same moment as in the moment produced by the force in the handle, the force here should be large. You understand? Because the moment produced here and the moment produced here, they both are equal. Its moment arm, the handle, its moment arm is very large. The moment arm for the piston is very small. So the force in the piston has to be larger. Because the moment is force multiplied distance. If the value of the distance is smaller, then the F value has to be larger to give the product of the moment, which is equals to the moment produced by that force. So that's why the force is greater in the P. That's the question. It's, it's a one mark question uh, to do its wording. It's a bit of a trick. So let me show you my work and we will see what the answer is. Okay, so here we go. Uh, moment produced in handle and, the, and, and piston is equal. 
moment arm of handle is larger, the so force will be smaller on handle. For same moment, force will be larger in the piston because its moment arm is smaller. One mark question. So let's check the marking scheme also. We have done two parts and so here we go. So here we have the question number three, A part, the marking scheme, first uh, the definition of the moment, the force into perpendicular distance, and the second one is smaller distance to pivot than from P to the pivot. So I think we have written the right argument. So let's go back, let's go back to the next question. The next question is B part. I think, yeah, we are done with this. Now we are on the B part. It's a two mark question. He says, explain how the hydraulic press enables a greater force to be exerted on the piston Q than is exerted on the piston P. So why a greater force is exerted on the piston Q as compared to the piston P? Let's go back to the diagram. Okay, so here we have this hydraulic press. So here we, in the hydraulic press, I have oil. This piston will push uh, this oil downward. So a pressure will be created in the oil. So, you know, uh, according to the Pascal's principle, whatever will be the uh, pressure created in this piston, in this oil here, the same uh, pressure will be exerted here. That's the Pascal's principle. And because the pressure here and the pressure here, both the pistons, both cylinders is same, so, but you know that the area of the piston Q is larger and the pressure is force divided by area. If uh, force, pressure is force divided by area. If the pressure here and the pressure here in both the cylinders, the pressure is same. And here the piston has a larger area and the pressure is equal to force divided by area to have the same pressure. If the area here is larger, naturally the force here uh, created should also be larger to get the same pressure. So simply you will write in the cylinder uh, Q, the piston area is larger as compared to the piston P and because in both the sides, the pressure is same. So here the force has to be larger to get the same pressure. So this is a two mark question. Uh, you can have a good look at that question. I have written this answer also. So then I will show you my answer and that is we can check the marking scheme. So he says that the pressure produced in the piston P and the piston Q is same according to the Pascal's principle because pressure is equal to force divided by area and the area of the piston Q is larger than the area of the piston P. So the force on the piston P will be larger as compared to the force on the piston P because both of them, the pressure is same. So this is, this is how I have written and the answer of question number three B part. Let's go actually check the marking scheme. So what the marking scheme says and the marking scheme says, okay, so here we have question number two and it's uh, parts are showing. Question number three B part, same equal pressure on the piston P and the piston Q one mark for this and larger area of the piston Q than the piston P. So we have right, written the right argument. So hopefully we'll get full marks. So let's go to the next part, question number three, C part. Okay, so here we have, okay. In moving the handle downwards, the 20 newton force moves through a distance of 0 0.60 meter. And the piston Q uh, rises by 0 0.020 meter. The force exerted by the piston Q on the paper is 400 newton calculate the work done in moving the handle downwards. So, uh, you know, uh, I know the force applied and I know the distance moved. So I can calculate how much is the work done. Uh, the work done will be equal to force into distance and that will be 20 Newton multiplied 0 0.60 meter. So, Okay, so you see he's asking you to calculate the work done and the force applied is 20 Newton and uh, distance moved by the object is 0 0.60 meters. So easily we can find out the work done. The work done is force multiplied distance. So simply multiply the 20 Newton with the, uh, the distance move. Let me show you my work, I've done this. And here we go, this is the next part. 
So question number C, first part, you can see that the work done is equal to F multiplied D. That will be 20 Newton multiplied 0 0.60 meter, and that will give you a 12 Newton work done. So the work done by the force of 20 Newton is 12 Newton, new, 12 joules, sorry. I wrote here Newton, this should be joules, okay? So we can add this, can add this, this is a very important thing. And it's, uh, this here, this is 12 joules. This is 12. Yo. Oh. Here you need to put uh, Joule is the answer. Okay. And same is goes with there. I will insert a text box. Insert a text box here. This is not Newton. This is not Newton. This will be eight joules. And fill the shape. Okay. Oh. oh. So it will be eight joules. I wrote by mistake, I wrote here Newton, so which is not right for students. So hopefully you have understood this first numerical. So let's move uh, to the next part. He says, uh, in the next part, he says, then uh, he says the work done in moving the handle downward, we have done this thing. And now the question is the efficiency of a hydraulic press. It's a two mark question where we have to calculate the efficiency of the hydraulic press. Then you see, if you want to calculate the efficiency of the hydraulic press, first of all, I need to find out what is the output energy or what is the out useful output work done. So useful output work done, I can calculate here, you know, the, which is the force which is produced in the piston uh, Q, that is 400 Newton. And the uh, piston Q is that 0 0.020 meter in the upward direction. So that is the useful work. Done. So I can calculate the useful output work done by multiplying these two forces, and then I can calculate the I know I know the useful output work done. I know the total input work done. Then I will multiply it with 100. I will be able to calculate the efficiency of this system. So very easily we can find out the efficiency of this system. Let me show you how we have done this. So here we go. Okay. So let me size so. So this is how question number three C sec second part work done is equal to F into D. That's four. That's the work done which is on the on that uh, piston Q. So F into D four hundred newton multiplied zero point zero two zero meter. That will be eight joules. Efficiency will be useful output energy divided by the total input energy multiply one hundred. So it will be eight joules divided by twelve multiply one hundred and that will be six point seven percent. So the efficiency of uh, system is approximately 67%. So this part was a little more complicated because here you have to first of all work to find, calculate what is the useful output work done, and then you have to calculate the efficiency. So that was the question number three. Let's check the marking scheme, what the marking scheme says. Then we can move on to the next question. So the marking scheme says that the, 12 joules and uh, here we go. 12 joules and the efficiency is work out divided by work input. So the final answer will be 67%. So our answers are right. So let's move to the next question. The next question is question number seven. So question number seven. So here we have question number seven is showing up on the screen. Question number seven. He says two mirrors A and B are inclined at an angle of 60 degrees to each other 
a light strikes mirror A at an angle of 30 degree as shown in the figure 4.1, determine the angle of incidence at the mirror PA. So here I have checked what is the angle of incidence for this purpose. I will draw a, a, a normal here. So when I will draw a normal here, then the angle between the normal and this incident ray, that will be the angle of incidence. Because the normal makes 90 degree angle with the surface. So if this angle is 30, so that angle will be 90 minus 30 and that will be 60. So the angle of incidence here will be 60 degree. The next question is determine the angle of incidence at the B, mirror B. You can see in that diagram, the light is traveling along the normal, the normal to the mirror B. So the light is traveling along the normal. So the angle of incidence here will be zero degree. The next question is, he says, describe the path of the reflected ray after it leaves the mirror B. Because here the light is striking the mirror B at an angle of zero degree, it's coming along the normal. So the light will strike and will go back. So the light will go back on the same. So the light will come here because it's making a 90 degree angle with the surface of the mirror. So the light will go back on the same path. Will go back on the same path. Okay. So the next question is a uh, plane mirror hanging on a wall is used to form the image of an object straight three characteristics of the image formed. The image formed in a plane mirror. The image formed is virtual. The image formed is erect or you can say upright. The image formed has the same size as that of the object. The distance of the image behind the mirror is equal to the distance of the object in front of the mirror. The image is laterally inverted. Laterally inverted means that the left side appears to be right and the right side appears to be left. And the image has front to back inversion. The height of the image, and or you can say size of the image and the size of the object, they both are equal to each other. The image is formed behind the mirror. These are the, some of the characteristics of the image formed in the plane mirror, and you only have to write three here. So this was the question number three. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you. That was question number four, sorry. So question number four, A, first part, the angle of incidence at the mirror A, that will be 60 degree. For you. Okay. So we, and then we will check the marking scheme also. So the angle of incidence for the mirror A will be 60 degree. The angle of incidence at the mirror B will be zero degree. And uh, it will go back on the same path it came. So from the mirror B, it will go back on the same path on the path on which it came. And the characteristic of the image formed in the plane mirror, you only have to mention here three. That is the image is virtual, image is upright, image is laterally inverted. So there are so many properties, you only have to write three of them here. So let's check the marking scheme. What the marking scheme says about the question number four here on your screen, you can see the marking scheme is showing for the question number four, a first part, a second part, a third part, and four B part. So our answers are perfect. You can have a good look on the marking scheme as well. So this was question number four. And let's go to the question number. Uh, now we go to the question number five. Okay, so question number five is coming up on your screen. The question number five is, here we go. So here we have question number five, the components of the electromagnetic spectrum have different uses. Microwaves are used in cooking and ultraviolet rays are used in the sterilization. Draw one line from each component of the spectrum to another suitable use for that component. So microwaves, a uh, very famous use of the microwave is that they are used for the satellite television. So join microwave, the satellite television and the ultraviolet is used for the sun beds. And I have done this on, uh, on a paper, let me show you. Yeah, this is the, this is that thing. So here you can see this, this is that part. Here you can see that the ultraviolet will be attached with the, join it with the light with the sun beds and the microwaves with the satellite television. Okay, so let's move to the next part. And the next part is, so the next part is, this is, uh, Figure 5.12, the microwave oven used to heat soup. The container for the soup is a glass bowl. So underline this word, 
container means that the container for the soup is a glass bowl. So the container for the that's that's a ball bowl, I, I, whatever you pronounce it, is is actually is made of glass, which has the soup. That is that is container. Okay. He says, explain the why the choice of the material for the container is important in the microwave cooking. You see, it's it's a very very famous issue also. You see, can you put the you put the utensil in which you put the food, and then you put it in the and in, in the in that uh, microwave oven. The material of that utensil is very important. He's asking, he's, he's, he's using the name container in which you put, you have put the soup. So the material of that container should be such that it should not stop the microwave. It should not absorb the microwave. It should let the microwave pass through it. It should not reflect the microwave. So that is the two properties, three properties which should be present in that material. And one very important thing, because when we use the uh, microwaves in our homes, don't put plastic uh, plastic utensils and try to heat them with the uh, in the microwave oven. Your food, you put your food in the plastic con containers and you heat them in the oven. This is not a good idea. So. Uh, the material of this container should be such that it should let the microwaves pass through it and it should not reflect them, it should not absorb them. So, uh, <clears throat> so I have written this one mark question. The important thing was to realize that the container means, container means that, uh, that means stop. Okay, so the question number five is B first part container, which is the glass bowl material should be such that it let the microwaves pass through it. It's a very simple question. And uh, so question number five, B second part, uh, we will move to the last from the first of all, from the question paper. The second part is, here we go. He says the soup is mostly water. It has other things also, but it's mostly water. Soup is mostly water. Microwaves are completely absorbed by a few centimeters of water. As a result, microwaves do not reach the center of the soup. The instructions suggest that after the microwave oven is turned off, the, stew, the soup is not stirred, is left for some minutes so that the center becomes hot. State the name of the and describe each of the two processes by which the thermal energy transfer throughout the soup after the microwave oven is turned off. So you see the two ways in which the soup, the heat can be uniformly distributed. One is the convection. So the first big method can be convection. So what will happen to the convection? So the water which is, uh, which is hot, that will become uh, less dense, that water will rise upward and from the top, the cold water will go down and the convection currents will set in and this way the heat will be distributed throughout the soup. The other method uh, uh, which will be the conduction. The conduction will happen because the soup is not only water, it has other contents also, solid contents in the soup. So the convection conduction will also happen and in the conduction you see what happens, that the material, uh, the, the, the particles which are close to each other, the, the, on the side where you have the heat, the temperature is high, the particles, they will start vibrating. Their amplitude of vibration will increase, they collide with their neighboring molecules and they make them vibrate vigorously. Their amplitude of vibration increases and they make their neighbor. So this by this, the, from molecule to molecule energy is transferred by the vibrations. So these are the two methods by which the, which the heat can be equally distributed, uniformly distributed after the microwave has been turned off. So it's a three mark question. Let's check how I have written this answer. So let's check my answer and then we will check from the marking scheme also. So here on your screen, you can see question number five B, second part. And the first method used is convection. Hot liquid will become less dense and will rise upward. Cold dense liquid will sink, setting up convection terms. Conduction uh, molecules which are in the hot portion 
will vibrate with larger amplitude and will make their neighbors vibrate vigorously and with larger amplitude. Thus, thermal energy will be passed on from molecule to molecule by vibrations. So this is the two methods by which the heat will be transferred, uh, will be distributed throughout the suit. So let's check the marking scheme, <clears throat> what the marking scheme has to say about this question, and then we can go on. So this is the, this is that first part, microwave, satellite, television, ultraviolet, sun bears, microwaves must pass or not be absorbed by the container or not reflected. So, and the B second part is convection and conduction named convection involves hot liquid rises, cold liquid falls. Conduction involves energy passes from molecule to molecule. These are the three marks. This was a three mark question and I hope that the answer <coughs> which we have written is good. <clears throat> so the marking scheme is in front of you. The three marks distribution is also given. Uh, so you can also write a very good answer. So let's move to the next question. The next question is question number six. Here we go. Question number six is coming on your screen and it says uh, the clock the iron shown in the figure 6.1 is connected to the electrical means. So here we have uh, iron is connected with the uh, cable to, to, in, into this socket. The, says, the question is, here we go. Is it the boxes in the left column below contain some electrical hazards? The boxes in the right column contain methods of protection these hazards for each hazard draw one line to the appropriate method of the protection. So the first one is to have one insulation on the cable to the iron. If the insulation is gone, so the best way is to have an inspection of the cable before you use it. So we will check of the cable before connecting to the main supply. So join this and this. The next one is loose live wire in the iron touches its metal case. For that purpose, we should have a earth wire and a fuse. <coughs> earth wire and fuse plug correctly connected to the iron, so join these two with each other. Okay. Next one is cable becomes hot, too hot because current is too high. So if uh, for this purpose we will have the circuit breakers, and so join these two circuit breaker correctly connected in the. So I have, this is a two mark question. Let me show you <laughs> on this. So you can see that uh, that part is showing up. So I have a good look on these parts, how you can connect them. And hopefully they are self free. So this is question number six, a part. Now we are, now let's move to the next part. So hopefully you have understood this. And the next question coming up on your screen is, there's B part. He says, uh, the power of the iron is 1200 watt. The cost of one kilowatt hour of electric energy is 20 cents. Define the kilowatt hour. The kilowatt hour is the amount of, of the energy used by, the, by an appliance whose power is one, kilowatt in one hour. The amount of energy used by an appliance of one kilowatt power in one hour, that energy used is one kilowatt hour. So this is the definition. And the next part is, uh, we will check its marking scheme also, but uh, let's do this one. The iron, is, the iron is on at full power for 20 minutes. Calculate the cost of running the iron for this time. So it's very simple numerical. It's a two marks numerical. Let's go where I have written this. So here. So uh, the first one here is the definition of the one kilowatt hour energy used by an appliance for one of one kilowatt power in one hour. So second part cost will be the power multiply time multiply price of the one kilowatt one kilowatt hour the power should be taken in the kilowatts and the time should be taken in hours. So you have 1200 watts, so divided with 1000. 
you have 20 minutes to divide it with 60 so convert it to hours and you multiply price of one kilowatt hour is 20 cents so when you multiply them the final answer will be eight cents so eight cents is the answer so the price of using that machine that iron for uh, for how much for 20 minutes will be eight eight cents so let's check the marking scheme what the marking scheme has to say Okay, so question number six is showing up on your screen. Uh, you can have a good look on all the questions we have done. Eight cent is the final answer. Our answer is right. So you can check the question number six A part, question number six B first part, question number six B second part. So um, I think that our answers are perfect. There's no issue. Okay, so let's move to the next question. And that's the question number seven of the section A. And in this session, you know, we are only solving the section A of this paper. This is May, June 2020, two, two paper. This paper belongs from the zone two. So uh, let's, uh, let's go uh, on question number seven. Okay, so the question number seven is showing up. Okay, here we go. Radon 222 is an isotope of radon which undergoes a series of radioactive decays. Uh, figure 7.1 is a diagram showing the proton number, atomic number, and nucleon number, and the mass number of the nuclei involved in the series of decays. The point P represents a nucleus of radon 22. So here, this is radon 22. You can see downstairs on the x-axis, on the x-axis. You can see on the x-axis, we have nucleon number and on the y-axis, we have proton number. So don't get confused. It's just a way of writing them. This is a way of conveying you the information of the mass number and the proton number. He has put that on the graph. So for example, if you see P, P's uh, proton number is 86 and its mass number or nucleon number is 222. For example, Q, its proton number is 84 and its uh, nucleon number is 218. For example, R, its proton number is 82 and its uh, nucleon number is 214. For example, S, its uh, proton number will be 83 and its mass number will be 214. For example, T, its proton number will be 84 and its mass number will be 214. For example, U, its proton number will be 82 and its mass number or nucleon number will, will be 210. So this is how you will read this uh, graph. And uh, there is first question coming up. State two points on the figure 7.1, which represents the isotope of the same element. You know, the isotope means that they should have the same proton number. So they should be on the same horizontal line. So they should have the same proton number. For example, T, proton number is 84. And the Q, they have the proton number of 84. So T and the Q, they have the same proton number. It means they are the isotope of the same element. So T and Q. In the same way, U, its proton number is 82. And R, its proton number is also 82. So U and R also are also the isotopes of the same so T and Q, they are isotope, and the U and R, they both are isotope because they have the same proton now. So that was the question number A, first part. The next question is, different isotopes of the same element have different atomic compositions. State how the composition of their atoms is different. So the isotopes, that you have to write the difference. So the isotopes have different number of neutrons in their nucleus, and their nucleons are different from each other. So this is the one more question. Let me show you my answer because that's the only answer I have written. Hopefully you have understood that what I am talking about. So here we have question number seven, A first part. P e and Q have the same proton number 84. R and U have the same proton number 82. Question number seven, the second part, they have different neon numbers. Numbers of neutrons are different in their nucleus. They have the different number of neutrons. I mean, their neutron numbers are different and they have different number of neutrons in their nucleus, in their nuclei. 
That's number seven. So I can check the marking scheme also. You can see here, seven first part and uh, seven a second part. So our answers are perfect. So let's move to the next part. The next part coming up is question number seven, B part and the first portion. First part. Uh, he says uh, uh, a nucleus of radon 222 emits an alpha particle as it decays. The radioactive decay of a single nucleus is random. Explain what is meant by random radioactive decay of a nucleus. Random means uh, of an atom. Its decay is random. It means that we cannot predict that when this nucleus will decay. And we also cannot predict exactly that what will come out of this uh, nucleus. So that is called a randomness. I cannot predict that when a certain nucleus will decay. So that means that uh, it's a random process. It's a random. Radioactive decay is random. So let me show you my answer. I have written this and then we can move on. Question number seven, B, first part, you can see we cannot predict when a nucleus will decay. So that is the randomness, okay? So that is called the random. So let's check the marking scheme. What does the mark? The time when decay occurs, particles emitted is not known, not constant or direction in which the particles emitted is not known, can be at any angle and direction. That is random. That can be so question number seven, B, first part is on your screen. The marking scheme is showing on your screen. Have a good look on this. I think we have written the right answer and you can write a better answer. So let's move to the next part. Okay, so this was the question number seven, B, first part. Now let's move to the next part. Here we go. He says in the nucleoid notation, radon, radon 222 is written as the radon uh, 86, 222, when a nucleus of radon 222 emits an alpha particle, it decays to an isotope of the polonium. PO complete the decay coin using for this decay. You see here, he has shown us that an alpha particle is given out. Alpha particle is like the nucleus of the helium. Its, uh, its, its, its atomic number is 2 and its mass number is 4. So here downstairs, write 2, here write 4. Whenever an alpha alpha decay happens, the daughter nucleus, its proton number is decreased by two and its mass number is decreased by four. Remember these my words, whenever an alpha decay happens, the daughter nucleus, its proton number will be two less than the, uh, the parent nucleus and its nucleon number will be four less than the, uh, the parent nucleus. Let me show you, I have solved it and let me show you my answer. So here we have, uh, this is the question number seven, the second part, you can see that here I have shown. So alpha two and four and uh, polonium, uh, the, the, the mass of the polonium will be four less than the radon and uh, atomic number, yeah, proton number, that will be two less. So it will be 84 and 218, and this is the symbol for the alpha particles. I hope that you will remember this uh, decay and you will never forget what is an alpha particle. And when an alpha particle is given out, that daughter nucleus proton number is two less than the parent nucleus and its uh, atomic uh, mass or atomic or the nucleon number is four less than the parent nucleus. So don't forget this fact. Okay. So let's move to the next part. And the next part is state the name, says, state the name of the particle emitted as a nucleus of R decays to a nucleus of S. The name, the R and S, he's talking about the R and S. So he's talking about the R and S. So here we go, R and S, so see here. So it's, uh, its atomic number of the R is 82, mass number is 214, and S atomic number is 83, and the mass number is 214, proton number. So you see when R is decayed and S is formed, the proton number has increased by one and the mass number has not changed. 
the proton number changed from 82 to 83, but the mass number remained to 14. This happens whenever a beta particle is given out. Remember these words. And whenever a beta decays happen, a beta particle is given out. The daughter nucleus, its proton number will increase by one, but the mass number or the nucleon number will remain unchanged. And the number of protons will be increased by one, the number of neutrons will be decreased by one, and the nucleon number will remain unchanged. So remember my first. Okay? So a beta decay has happened. When the R converted into S, the beta decay had happened. I have done this on a paper also. So then the next question is, describe the change in the composition of a nucleus of R as it decays to a nucleus of S. I just described you. Let me show you my answer and then I can explain it later on. So here we go. So uh, beta particle is emitted. Uh, here I have written this uh, R and S from that graph so that you can understand it clearly. Here a beta particle is given out. You see the daughter nucleus has one proton number more as compared to the parent nucleus. That only happens in the beta decays and the mass number or the nucleon number has not changed. So the beta particle is given out. This is a symbol for the beta particle. So beta particle. Okay. So if you look at the if you look at the radon, radon has 82 protons and neutrons are 132, and its nucleon number is 214. Whereas the S will have uh, 83 protons and the neutrons will be 131. So S will have one neutron less in nucleus as compared to the nucleus of R. S will have one more proton as compared to the nucleus of R. So hopefully you have understood this. I have drawn this so you can understand it easily. So let's check the marking scheme and then see. So here you can see the marking scheme is showing up on your screen. So electrons or beta particles, R gains or R has one more proton and R has less or one proton less. So that was the question number. Uh, uh, that was the question number seven. That question seven is done. Then the question section D will start. So uh, my dear students, today, uh, today in this uh, session, uh, we have done May, June 2020. 2-2 paper, and this paper is from the zone two. We, in this session, in this video, we have done only the section A of this. Section B of this paper, I will do in another video, and I will upload in my YouTube channel. You will be able to find out that video, the section B of this paper. Uh, I hope that this video will be helpful to you. If this video is helpful to you, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And don't forget to uh, suggest these videos to your friends so everybody can benefit from them. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have a good day, and God bless you all.